Oh, so we're here at Greener Gadgets with Mary Lou Jepson, uh, formerly of OLPC. That's right. Um, and she's going to tell us about the greener aspects of the OLPC, which is sitting next to her on the table. Hey. Put the ears up. Okay. <laughs> um, well, part of the greener aspects is the laptop's green, but that actually has That's nothing the, the to literal, do with it. The literal green aspect of the OLPC. But that has nothing to do with it being <laughs> the greenest laptop on the planet. Um, uh, what does have to do with that is sort of following, you know, getting rid of the toxic chemicals, mm -hmm. getting rid of the mercury and the backlight. But that's not how we made the laptop environmentally friendly. In fact, by not focusing on environmental friendliness, envir does that make sense? environmental friendliness. It wasn't the first priority. It, no, it wasn't in the top five. The, t the, the key thing was how to make a low-power, low-cost, mm -hmm. long-life, field-repairable laptop for children in the developing world, some of the poorest children in the world. Um, there are about a billion kids that aren't well-served in their schools, and to transform their education, we needed to get them something they could use. And by focusing on robust, long-life, field repairability, and um, low-power, we actually made the greenest laptop on the planet paradoxically, and it costs less, not more, mm -hmm. than um, what you would believe is that to be green costs a little bit more, but you're saving you know, the environment. And in fact, if you actually think about designing things for the developing world, by definition, you'll make them green because they don't have electricity there. School is sometimes underneath a tree. I mean, families live in, in one room, and so they spend a lot of time outside, and it needs to be robust, right? And it needs to be repairable. And if you just do those things, and if you look, there's a, I mean, there's a step function. Three billion people in the world now have cell phones. Half of all Africans will have cell phones in two years. It's, it's, it's the moment where these new consumers will demand different things in their products. And the question is, can we in the rich, developed world also embrace you know, the things that, that they need. So real, real quickly, what are, what are a few of the, uh, the greener aspects? like tech, tech, uh, tech uh, It's about 5% the power consumption mm -hmm. of a regular laptop. You can plug in a small hand crank to power it, a solar panel, a wind machine, water, cows can be powered like <laughs> by walking around mm -hmm. the system. Um, there's no uh, toxic chemicals in it, there's no mercury in it. And um, another aspect that's actually ignored by the current environmental sort of Boy Scout badges that you can get, or even Energy Star, is uh, uh, the lifetime of the product is, is not part of that. Mm -hmm. It's about, what, two years now for a standard laptop, something like that? Two years. Yeah. And this is a five-year life. Mm -hmm. And um, that matters. It's half the size and weight. It's a third the part count. Mm -hmm. And those things aren't incorporated into um, figuring that out because we've got such maybe hedonistic consumer <laughs> culture that really wants to purchase things that we ignore that. But, you know, designing things to be robust and reliable and last a long time is actually another way to be green. I think Paul Hawken said it very well in the New York Times last year when he said, you know, this green consumerism is an oxymoron. Green isn't about consumerism, it's about not buying stuff. Well, he's helped on this project and, you know, still we can transform children's lives through this. Environmentally, it's better than standing a stack of textbooks. It's any of this left.